Today's webinar is on opportunities and challenges for marine CDR approaches in the Southern Ocean. And this is a little bit of a different webinar format to what we usually do. Today, we're going to have three short presentations and then more of an open discussion. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to give a very brief intro to the topic and introduce our speakers and then we'll get started. So uh, today we have um, Manon Berger, who's a PhD candidate at LMD IPSL ENS, lots of um, acronyms there um, in Paris. Um, uh, Jing He, who's a carbon removal scientist at Isometric, and Leonard Bach, who's an associate professor at the University of Tasmania, IMAS. Uh, so, okay. So, the first big question here is why research uh, marine carbon dioxide removal in general? And uh, the IPCC sixth assessment report says that uh, carbon removal is essentially unavoidable to meet um, the sort of Paris Agreement targets, particularly 1.5 degrees Celsius um, warming. And the figure on the right sort of shows um, that there's certain emissions, even with really drastic emissions reductions, there's certain unavoidable emissions that will require carbon removal to offset. Uh, the second thing is the oceans dominate the global carbon inventory. And so they really offer potential scaling that's needed for gigaton scale carbon dioxide removal. And then the third really important thing is that there's large gaps right now in our understanding of ocean biogeochemical and, and biological ecosystem processes and, and the potential ecosystem impacts of marine carbon dioxide removal. So then the second question is why research marine CDR in the Southern Ocean specifically? Uh, first off, it's big. It's a really large area of ocean. And so it has a really a large potential uh, capacity for uh, taking up excess carbon. Uh, the Southern Ocean also has really unique circulation and surface properties. And I won't say much about that because I'm sure the speakers will say more, uh, but in particular, it's a high nitrate. Uh, low chlorophyll region. Um, third, the biogeochemistry and ecosystem dynamics uh, are less well understood in the Southern Ocean than many other ocean regions because of the challenge of year-round observations um, with the uh, harsh conditions and sea ice cover in the Southern Ocean. And then finally, there's a need to understand potential impacts on highly vulnerable um, Antarctic ecosystems. So with that as sort of motivation, um, I will stop sharing and we have Jing up first. And just a note, if you have um, questions during the talks, please put them in the chat. And um, what we'll try and do is get through the three presentations and then uh, maybe ask you know one question of each speaker in between and then we'll go to questions and discussion at the end. So if you can share your screen, Jing. Good. Let's try that. Um, one second. That's probably not right, right? It's all we see the summary. Yep, that looks right. Okay, awesome. Um, I'll go ahead and get started then. Um, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks, Veronica, for organizing this, and I'm really looking forward to all the other uh, talks and discussions. So a caveat before we start is that I am not a Southern Ocean expert. Um, my PhD was on submesoscale biophysical interactions, and I've done some work studying ocean alkalinity enhancement. And then for the past nine years or so, I've been working at Isometric, which is a climate tech startup, uh, focusing on MCDR measurement reporting and verification, which is MRV. Sorry for the many acronyms. So today in 10 minutes, I'd like to 
um, go over a little bit of some of my previous work on ocean alkalinity enhancement, in particular, looking at some of the implications for the Southern Ocean. And then I'd also like to talk a little bit about some of my current work uh, working at a climate tech startup. So just as a very brief overview, um, what is ocean alkalinity enhancement? So some of you may have heard of this um, being used as an analogy of a Tums or an antacid for the ocean. So alkalinity is um, the excess of proton acceptors over proton donors. So in pure alkalinity, um, as an example, is hydroxide or OH minus. And when you add alkalinity to the ocean, you're increasing the ocean's capacity to take up more and CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store that. Um, and it also has an additional co-benefit of locally mitigating um, ocean acidification. So over here, um, I have an overview of the marine carbonate system, which is this multiple equilibrium state des described by these uh, reactions. So CO2 exchanges between the atmosphere and the ocean, and then CO2 dissolved in seawater undergoes a series of chemical reactions, and the majority of dissolved inorganic carbon stored in the ocean is in the form of bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, or carbonate, CO3, two minus. And when you add alkalinity to the ocean, you temporarily increase the pH, and that causes a shift in this entire carbonate system in the direction of the red arrows towards more bicarbonate and carbonate, and that decreases the concentration of dissolved CO2 in the ocean, and that causes more um, CO2 uptake from the atmosphere. So a couple of years ago, I worked with Dr. Mike Taika at Google Research, um, looking at some global scale modeling of ocean alkalinity enhancement along coastlines. And we focused on coastal areas because that seemed the most practical. Um, we think most likely alkalinity sourcing will be uh, done on land due to the availability, availability of energy and resources. And so our framework was thinking about um, taking alkalinity from land and dispersing it near the coast in ships, um, for instance, like the schematic. And one of our key questions that we wanted to answer was, what are some of the optimal locations around the world for nearshore OAE? And I won't go into too much details um, for the sake of time, but you can find more information in our paper. So very briefly, uh, we simulate OAE in a global ocean model. We use the one third degree echo LLC 270 state estimate. And we couple a fairly simple biogeochemical model following Dukowitz et al, which um, simulates five tracers. So we have alkalinity, DIC, phosphorus, dissolved organic phosphorus, and then dissolved oxygen. And just going to jump to some results. Um, I'll just focus on what are some promising areas of OAE, and particularly um, in the Southern Ocean area. So this map here is showing the uh, maximum alkalinity addition rate in every grid cell in the model, um, with a constraint that the pH cannot be changed by more than 0.1 compared to a baseline simulation. So the color bar shows what our maximum capacity for alkalinity addition is. So areas of green and blue are places with uh, strong currents that rapidly disperse your alkalinity. And you can add more without changing the pH that much. And then areas that are colors that are beige are areas where you can't add a lot of alkalinity because that would cause too much local pH change. And the pH threshold that we used is 0.1, which is fairly small and conservative. So if we look at the Southern Ocean, we see a lot of it is beige, indicating that it's not necessarily an optimal location for scaling ocean alkalinity enhancement. 
Um, but as you go farther away from the Antarctic continent, um, more north, like into the core of the ACC, we can start to see these uh, green areas indicating higher capacity. So in particular, the Drake Passage seems like a good place. So if anyone um, wants to do some OAE next time they have a cruise there, be my guest. And then another place that really stands out as a really high capacity um, location globally is the Kerguelen Islands over here. Um, we can see this has some of the largest capacity in the world actually. And I'm sure there's some really interesting local uh, circulation and dynamics around the Kerguelen Plateau that's responsible for that. That I'm sure this audience knows more about than me. Um, we can also look at the induced change in air sea CO2 flux as a result of OAE. So this is the change in the CO2 flux between our OAE simulation minus a reference simulation. And the fluxes are all positive, indicating net CO2 flux going into the ocean as a result of increased ocean uptake of CO2 or a reduction of the natural outgassing. And again, we see that um, Kerguelen really stands out as actually one of the um, places in the whole world that experiences the biggest increase in CO2 flux as a result of OAE, which again could be a combination of factors, um, high wind speeds in this area. Um, and then, yeah, maybe the shallowness of the Kerguelen Plateau means that the alkalinity that you add remains near the surface. Um, another thing we can look at is the temporal evolution of the CO2 uptake. So this plot on the left here, um, x, the x-axis is time, and then the y-axis is what we call a OAE uptake efficiency, defined as the change in DIC divided by the change in alkalinity between an OAE simulation and then a reference simulation. So for the simulations that make up this left curve, left plot. Um, we did one month pulse experiments where OAE was, where alkalinity was added in a patch um, over the course of a month. And then we watched the subsequent CO2 uptake in the model. And again, Kerguelen really stands out as one of the um, most optimal places in the world where you have really fast uh, air sea equilibration, so it occurs in less than a year, and you reach near complete equilibration where you have an uptake efficiency of over 0 0.8. And then some other places around the world um, are also plotted for comparison. So Iceland, for example, has um, a much lower efficiency because any al alkalinity that you add there um, it just sinks immediately due to the deep water formation there. And so you don't have complete equilibration. So I'm running a little short on time, um, but I wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about some of my current work, trying to think about more practically, how do we actually quantify CO2 uptake from an OAE project in practice? And um, this is the work that me and some of my colleagues at Isometric have been doing. Um, for a bit of context about our company, Isometric is a carbon registry, and we work on um, creating robust, scientifically rigorous and robust frameworks for quantifying CO2 uptake across various emerging durable carbon removal approaches, including marine CDR. And we don't do any carbon removal deployments ourselves. Instead, we focus on the development of protocols, um, supporting third-party verification, and then um, transparently showcasing carbon removal calculations and data on our platform. And very quickly, um, we've been working on an OAE protocol over the past couple of months. And the goal of the protocol is to describe how a carbon removal credit um, is actually calculated. And we also want this to be a community level protocol 
um, that can be applied to multiple companies that might be doing OAE in slightly different ways, but we want the quantification of the carbon removal to be done in a consistent manner. Um, for the sake of time, I might just end there because I am at my limit. So I'll just jump to my conclusions, which are there are some potentially promising locations for OAE in the Southern Ocean, um, but we need more regional uh, studies to further explore them. And then the second two points are from my, um, are things that I didn't really get to, but just on the topic of practical practical MRV for actual OAE deployments, one thing that we really need are more multi-scale studies that span measurement reporting and verification from a point source OAE discharge that a company might actually be doing up to the air-sea gas exchange scale that I've been talking about. So there's a real gap for more near field measurements and models to bridge those drastically different scales. And then another thing just to, um, that I didn't get a chance to talk about is just some practical challenges for scaling OAE in the Southern Ocean. So for instance, thinking about how are we going to move alkaline feedstock from wherever they are sourced all the way to the Southern Ocean, you need to factor in the transportation costs, but also the emissions related to the transportation um, as an example. So thanks, sorry for going over time and I'll just stop right there. Thank you very much, Jing. Um, Manon, you can start getting your screen shared. In the meantime, if anyone wants to drop questions in the chat, but I'll just ask a quick one now um, while Manon shares her screen. Um, you know, the Drake Passage and Kerguelen show up um, as hotspots in your, your maps, Jing, but maybe that's partially because there's actually land or islands there to have coastlines. Like, do you think if you had extended that analysis to open oceans that the whole kind of ACC um, would light up because it's sort of broadly an upwelling region with high wind speeds? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense um, that if you expanded to cover more of the open ocean, the uh, ACC could be a particularly promising spot. I think from a practicality point of view, uh, there's some interesting questions about open ocean deployments and mm -hmm. I think some of the measurements and ecological monitoring might be even more challenging there. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, Manon, when you're ready. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. So I'm Manon Berger. I'm a PhD student in Paris and I'm working with Lester Kiatowski, Laurent Bob and uh, David Ho on a CDR mo modeling, so particularly on macroalgae cultivation and also on alkalinization. So, um, so as uh, you, 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 you are now a bit familiar with um, alkalinization with a Jing presentation, so ocean alkalinity enhancement or OAE uh, includes several types of methods. So there is, there is the dissolution of carbonate of silicate uh, minerals, just like uh, olivine, or the electrochemical generation of uh, NaOH. While uh, macroalgae uh, cultivation, uh, so macroalgae, or we can call it seaweed, are planted on ropes, uh, so just like in the photo. And during the growth, they convert uh, inorganic carbon into organic carbon. And uh, then the biomass is either uh, used uh, to reduce emission of some industries, or it has been uh, considered to sink it to depth to isolate the remineralized CO2 from the atmosphere. So both methods uh, lower sur surface ocean PCO2 and increase uh, the ocean carbon uptake. However, there is uh, some modeling study, but few that include um, nutrient feedbacks for both macroalgae and uh, alkalinization. And there is no global CDR comparison of OAE and macroalgae cultivation within, within the same model. So we lack uh, information on the efficiency, the impacts necessary to make a well-informed decision. And so here in uh, the study I will uh, present, uh, we simulate a global deployment of macroalgae cultivation and olivine addition 
using the Nemopiscus ocean biogeochemical model uh, at higher resolution. So seaweed was grown and harvested in an exclusive economic zone, easy, in the top 100 meters. And uh, this deployment corresponds to uh, about uh, um, biomass uh, of 12 petagram of uh, harvested wet biomass uh, every year. Um, and we run uh, two simulations. So the first macro, where uh, seaweed is a simplistic, uh, si simply um, simulated as a uniform and unconstrained carbon sink. And another called macro MP, where uh, seaweed is also consuming uh, nitrate and phosphate. And uh, because of this, there is less um, nutri macronutrient left for phytoplankton. So it triggers uh, phytoplankton feedback. And then we look at the additional carbon uptake or the CDR flux. And so first, uh, we found that both simulations are very similar in the Southern Ocean. And this is because the Southern Ocean is not limited by nitrate and phosphate. And, um, and so there is little effect of uh, the macroalgae uh, limitation, uh, nutrient limitation and consumption. And one other thing is that uh, the ocean CDR occurs at a far wider scale than uh, the, the region of production. So potentially hindering MRV in the, in the Southern Ocean. And so we compare this simulation with simulation with olivine addition. So um, the same mass of olivine was added in the top 10 meters of uh, exclu exclusive economic zone. And we run two simulations, one where olivine addition is simulated as an um, alkalinity addition uniform and at a constant rate. And another where, uh, in addition to alkalinity, uh, silice and iron that are contained in the olivine are also released in the top 10 meter. And so this simulation will also trigger a phyton plankton feedback. And so we compare uh, the CDR flux of uh, these four simulation. And uh, one thing we, we found out is that um, OAE or the alkanity addition, uh, the CDR flux are way higher. So the scale here is a uh, change compared to macro uh, macro G simulation. So the, the CDR flux is way higher. And when uh, we look at the simulation with addition of nutrients, silice and iron, uh, there is um, a lot, uh, in a lot of regions, uh, this addition of uh, nutrients is increasing the CDR flux, uh, as shown by the purple area. But there is also some uh, red area where, uh, so it triggers a negative CDR flux. Um, and this is because uh, the phytoplankton feedback uh, and uh, because uh, the phytoplankton product productivity is reduced. So with the same mass of olivine addition or harvested wet biomass, uh, we found that OAE CDR is tenfold, about tenfold um, higher than uh, macroalgae cultivation. And this is largely uh, attributed to the alkalinity contents of olivine compared to the carbon content of wet macroalgae biomass, which is uh, quite uh, low. And so in the uh, macro NP simulation, 50% uh, of the flux of a CDR flux is outside the site of uh, harvesting compared to 60% uh, for um, for the simulation with alkalinity and nutrient addition. So again, this, uh, this might uh, be a, an issue for MRV. And then the addition of uh, iron and, um, and silice has a positive near field effect. So in the, inside of the easy borders, but, um, um, but it also triggers um, a negative CDR flux corresponding to a decrease of phytoplankton production. And one thing we didn't consider here is um, that macroalgae is also consuming and limiting by and limited by uh, iron. And, um, and a recent study showed that macroalgic, macroalgic cultivation cannot be sustained uh, in the Southern Ocean and it may require uh, uh, iron fertilization in addition to, 
to maintain the, the cultivation. So we wanted to test uh, this hypothesis. And so we ran four simulation. So the first two are uh, similar than the previous one. And for the last two, um, macrology is also consuming and limited by iron. So we ran two uh, iron simulation, one with high, uh, high iron consumption and limitation, and one with low uh, iron limitation and consumption. And this is based on a literature review. And so for all the four uh, simulation, the growth rate of macrology cultivation is temperature and light limited and scaled to be globally a 0.5 petagram of carbon per year. Um, so we found out that uh, iron limitation and consumption trigger a strong phytoplankton response. Uh, so there, there is this red area in the low iron experiments that are widely extended in the high iron experiment. And uh, if we have a global view, so if we globally integrate uh, the CDR efficiency, uh, the iron limitation and consumption make the efficiency drop uh, to 20 uh, percent in the low iron experiment to minus 20 percent in the high um, high iron experiment. And if we focus uh, on the southern ocean, uh, this uh, this this experiment is actually um, uh, as always a negative uh, CDR efficiency. So from minus 13 to minus 60 percent considering iron uh, limitation and consumption. And so the take home message are that uh, 50 to 60% of the CDR flux occurs beyond uh, injection and cultivation areas, potentially hindering MRV, as I said. That uh, nutrient removal limits the CDR flux, and in particular for the sovereign ocean, iron limitation and consumption can result in a net negative CDR. The addition of nutrients and uh, in particular silice and iron increase locally the CDR flux, but can cause a four-field negative phytoplankton response, which is uh, bad for the CDR efficiency, but which also can impact uh, food webs, as showed uh, in Tagliabue et al. And uh, finally, uh, this, uh, this simulation, in this simulation, the olivin addition results in a quite a large uh, carbon uptake up to two to three petagram of carbon per year. But it's important to note that it's highly unrealistic as uh, the mass of the olivine added here is roughly equivalent to the total tonnage of uh, global maritime shipping. So it's completely uh, huge and it's can't, um, this cannot be done without associated emissions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. <laughs> Let's, um... Um, move on to Lena when you're ready to share your screen. Um, any questions for Manon can go in the chat. Um, I'll ask a quick one while um, Lena shares. Uh, do you think that the, you know, you show 50 to 60 percent of the flux occurs more spread out. Do you think the Southern Ocean is sort of uniquely challenging here because there's such a, you know, the ACC is such a big current and it spreads, spreads things out more widely. Do you think it's more challenging than elsewhere in the ocean? Um, yes, I think uh, this, uh, obviously this is more challenging uh, here uh, in the Southern Ocean, but also um, uh, like the main uh, issue might be like the, the not complete uh, CO2 equilibration. So, um, I, do, I haven't looked at this speci specifically in the Southern Ocean, but if um, if we can reach a quite constant uh, uh, air sea equilibration, uh, this might not be a problem of the size of uh, the plume, actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this should be entered in the consideration. Okay, great. All right, uh, Leonard's up. We have some more questions in the chat and we'll get to them um, at the end, okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Veronica, for organizing this and uh, Jing and Manon for the excellent talks already. Uh, well, this one's more, is very specific towards one study uh, that we did last or published last year, actually did it quite a while ago because the review process was a pain in the ass. But anyway, so uh, yeah, that is about iron fertilization, more a bit of a 
the classical thing in the Southern Ocean. And um, but we didn't use a model in that case. We used uh, all sorts of observations and a little bit of modeling, physical modeling, no, no biogeochemical modeling, um, data mining a lot. Um, because the goal was to identify the most co cost efficient regions for CO2 removal uh, with iron fertilization. And I'll briefly step you through the rationale for this. Is it moving? Yeah, here we go. So um, OIF, or Ocean Iron Fertilization abbreviated here, um, has been thought global from the start, really, because um, the, the those modeling studies that have been done on this approach were asking questions like, what if we fertilize the entire ocean or entire ocean bas basins with iron? And then they came up with um, those sorts of, uh, well, graphics or summaries. Uh, where they said, okay, how much is the atmospheric PCO2 changing or how much more is the ocean uh, taking up carbon? But um, I think or we thought that uh, these metrics actually have very limited relevance for um, how the carbon market is set up today because the, the carbon market would not ask these questions. It's not really relevant how much atmospheric CO2 um, is dec de decreased. Because what the what the carbon market as it is set up today, so because CDR is essentially a, well, how do you say that in a nice way, but it's essentially a capitalistic approach, right? You, you build a new business and you try to scale it. But um, the metric that incentivizes uh, MCDR, like OIF, um, is how much does a ton of CO2 cost and for durable storage, right? So the, the question is not how much you can remove, but the cost. the question is how much does it cost per ton? And um, so you can see that evolving here, for example, with um, like this consortium, which is a big, huge investment fund of uh, the size of one volume of 1.3 billion US dollars that they um, basically um, yeah, pump into the market to, to establish uh, startups. And uh, they buy, purchase um, carbon removal on a, on a small scale, like a couple of hundred tons of CO2. And what this tells us that for, for OIF to function, it doesn't have to be large scale to be successful. It just has to be cheap. So we approached, the, like we took this approach uh, for, for the study we did. And um, yeah, that motivated the question. We needed to identify the areas in the Southern Ocean where OIF would be most cost efficient or most efficient and cost efficient as such. So, um, so the study starts with identifying a variety of metrics that um, affects cost efficiency and then we use this uh, these metrics uh, to translate it into regional differences so our goal was to have a gridded like a gridded data set a map essentially on the costs per ton co2 across the well around the southern in the southern ocean around antarctica so we came up with these five criteria and these may be important but there may be others but we thought okay these five are central to the process and um, I'll start with the criterion we started to investigate first, which is nutrient reallocation. Because the problem is, and Manon has touched upon this already, if nutrients are utilized for OIF in the Southern Ocean, but these nutrients would actually be utilized anyways downstream naturally, then this leads to non-additional carbon fixation because you know you you increase uh, carbon fixation in the southern ocean but you decrease it elsewhere so you get you have to minus this off and this is uh, what we call additionality and of course OIF would have to be additional so how can we circumvent this problem because we thought there's no way we're ever going to be able to quantify this in a meaningful way outside a model in the real world and therefore our our thought was uh, we probably have to circumvent it so, okay, we looked at this classic scheme. This is a, just another drawing of it, of the, uh, well, latitudinal um, circulation pattern roughly of the Southern Ocean. So we got upper and lower circumpolar deep water upwelling. And then on the shelves, we have dense shelf water formation and Antarctic bottom water formation and, you know, how the circulation works. So um, in order to circumvent this problem, we shouldn't probably do iron fertilization in water masses where uh, well, where the nutrients that are upwelled are used downstream anyways. And uh, thinking of it in the simplistic scheme, you can say that, well, nutrients that are uh, upwelled and then downwelled into Antarctic bottom water, those are a part of the lower overturning circulation cells and, and therefore 
um, possibly in a death loop or at least for a very long time not used downstream for productivity. So what we thought, A, we need to restrict iron fertilization in order to circumvent this problem largely uh, into this um, lower uh, lower cell. So where where um, where the upwelled water subsequently turns into Antarctic bottom water. So what we needed to do first is identifying this boundary in the surface ocean between the upper and the lower cell um, yeah, we need to identify where it is. And this 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 boundary has been called the Southern Ocean Biogeochemical Divide in um, conceptual biogeochemical papers before. But those papers used models that were not fit for purpose to identifying the location. So we needed to, to, to take a little bit of a different approach. And what we did is this is like a spin-off study from this actual study. And we used um, a model that is kind of good in, um, well deep water formation patterns. Uh, this is XS01. It has one of a 10th degree uh, resolution. And then Ying Wan did the study with Lagrangian particle tracking and out came this map. And what you see basically, what you what you see here is um, the blue part is where um, where lower cell uh, water would be in the, in the surface ocean. And the red one is where the upper cell water would be in the surface ocean. And basically what it means is that you would have to restrict ocean iron fertilization in the into the blue parts of this uh, map. So very close to Antarctica, much closer than any um, previous mesoscale enrichment study has been done. And that already uh, restricts where you can do ocean iron fertilization, obviously, or where you, according to this criterion, at least. Um, the second one, and I'll step you through that quickly because that's rather trivial, although it was a lot of work to come to that point, but anyways. Um, so you obviously need a lack of natural iron availability because it makes no sense to fertilize with iron when there, when there is, is already iron. And uh, the other thing is you need sufficient light to enable growth of phytoplankton. And just very quickly, we did a lot of data mining to constrain this, but um, the red dots, this is based on geotracers data, the red dots basically show where there would be not enough iron to f f stimulate uh, relevant productivity, and that's basically everywhere. So probably iron is not the limiting factor. So you can assume that iron is always limiting for OIF to make sense, more or less always. Uh, Light-wise, it was a bit more complicated, but the similar take-home message here is that light is probably not an issue for ocean iron fertilization. So when you, you just see, like looking at that scale, just the below that red bar, so close to zero would be not enough light, obviously. Um, there's a lot of data gaps. But I would say, generally speaking, in summer, there would be enough light for ocean iron fertilization to work from the productivity side. Um, so here comes a big one, big one. So you need, of course, efficient and durable carbon export because the productivity that takes place in the surface ocean needs to be exported. Otherwise, the carbon stays in the surface ocean, gets remineralized and just is back in the atmosphere ASAP. And um, yeah. So where, where is the efficient, uh, efficient export? So we're coming back to that simplified scheme and we're thinking, okay, where's the best location to do that? And um, circumpolar deep water, as we all know, the Southern Ocean is a big upwelling system and circumpolar deep water pushes that water upwards. So the problem is if you pump by iron fertilization, organic carbon into uh, upwelling circumpolar deep water, it only stays there for a couple of decades uh, uh, at, at best, right? So you have the carbon back at the surface very quickly because you inject it into an upwelling system. However, if you get it into an Arctic bottom water, which has a different flow pattern, then um, you have it sequestered for much longer. And perhaps the best location to do it uh, may be on the shelves because the carbon there, because the Arctic bottom water is essentially close or near the surface, um, on the shelves, whereas if you go further offshore, you'd, the carbon would have to sink much deeper to reach it, right? And a lot of more carbon would get respired on the on the trajectory on the, on its pathway down. So we looked at the map, um, and we also looked at observational data, but it was a bit sparse. So we used um, again XS02. So we used we looked at where is the surface layer of Antarctic bottom water in the Southern Ocean in this model. And as you can see, I mean, not surprisingly, it's very deep offshore, but it's very sh shallow on the on the shelf regions. So accordingly, um, when we do uh, like, and this is a, 
basically a Monte Carlo approach based on observational um, Martin curve B values and export ratios. I'm not going into the details, but this is essentially a Martin curve and um, parameterized with lots of different B values that have been observed in the Southern Ocean. And what you see is that um, on the right side, the probability for uh, carbon remaining or organic carbon that is not respired, the probability for that is comparatively high when the depth of the Antarctic uh, bottom water surface layer is only 200 meters. But if you go deeper, so if the Antarctic bottom water is deeper and deeper, then a smaller fraction of that um, fixed organic carbon remains more it's getting respired. And obviously that reduces your um, durability because then, in, then of course, uh, the carbon would have been respired uh, in shallower waters, in upwelling waters that bring it back to the surface straight away. So we said, um, essentially what we did in the study was we said, carbon sequestered into Antarctic bottom water is very durable and carbon sequestered into a circumpolar deep water, which is upwelling, is not at all durable and therefore not um, aspirational. Uh, yeah, this is just a map showing, showing um, more or less the same thing, that you get very high percentage of carbon um, success into Antarctic bottom water, so successful transfer of carbon into Antarctic bottom water on the shelves and very little success offshore. Yeah, um, so that puts the focus on the shelves. And we did a last assessment, and I'll go through that very quickly because um, you already touched upon this, and this is air sea CO2 transfer to match OIF induced seawater seas CO2 drawdown, because of course you need to make sure that the carbon is also has the time to enter the water mass um, after the carbon has been fixed in seawater, because OIF does fix CO2 in seawater and not in the atmosphere. And um, just uh, quickly, there's no not so many red flags on that aspect. So most of the carbon, uh, like the air gas exchange is fast enough. Some exceptions on the shelves. So here um, in deep water formation regions where the water is very short at the surface before it's, get, it's getting injected into the deep ocean. So there is some areas of concern, but those are small. Uh, okay, so translating all this into... Um, into bio, all this biogeochemical information into OIF costs. So that's what we call the money plot. Um, what you see is here is the this gridded data set, lots of gaps because of yeah, obvious data gaps, um, <laughs> CIs and things. Um, so the, the, the take home message here is that OIF would be uh, probably prohibitively expensive or even negative, meaning it, yeah, anyway, so, so just very expensive offshore. And, but on the other hand, very, and that surprised me, very cheap, below $50 per ton CO2 on the shelves. Um, yeah, so that clearly draws the focus on the shelves, at least for us. Um, but the, <laughs> there's a, there's a con of, there's always something. Um, the thing is, um, we also did a Monte Carlo simulation where we assumed all sorts of uncertainties to get a hold of, hey, uh, how variable is the cost? And um, the, the variability of the cost due to all these uncertainties and carbon export, SE gas exchange and all these things is quite high. So if we wanted to do um, uh, OIF on the shelf, there would be quite a high probability that the cost is somewhere between zero and uh, 100 US dollar per ton CO2 but we wouldn't know the exact cost. Uh, whereas offshore, we would be quite certain that the cost is much, much beyond um, 100 US dollar. Um, and, and in a very few cases, it's below. Yeah, uh, that's the cost probability. And I hope I haven't uh, crossed the time frame. Anyway, so this is a, a big thank you to all these co-authors, especially also to Veronica. And can just can say it's fantastic to work with Veronica. So thanks, Veronica. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And thank you to all the speakers. Um, uh, a round of applause. Um, okay, so I can see a question from Bruno for Leonard. We'll start with that one. And please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Or if you want to, um, you can virtually raise your hand. Uh, so the question for Leonard. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiring talk. I'm wondering about the impact of sea ice that drives the deep water formation, but also impedes air sea exchange. Is it really enough ventilation in the seasonal ice zone to allow CO2 uptake? 
Uh, no, I mean, that's exactly the thing in, in the, so the Polinia regions were those that were particularly efficient. Be, and the reason for that was that the carbon export, uh, because Antarctic bottom water is so shallow, so carbon has just not such a big travel um, distance to take in order to get into a water mass that permanently locks in, locks it, locks it in. But the flip side is, of course, that the, uh, yeah, exactly what you say, um, the the time from fertilization say you do it in summer and then the injection of that water mass into the deep ocean is super short and therefore only a fraction of it is um, actually um, taken up by the atmosphere so you kind of create an undersaturated blob of water but that effect is relatively smaller than the benefits of the carbon um, the carbon uh, transfer so it outweighs the carbon the efficiency in the carbon transfer outweighs that effect to some extent but still, it, it reduces it. Yeah. Okay. There's another question for Leonard. Uh, great talk. Where does the high uncertainty of cost estimate of nearshore OIF come from? That's from Meng Yang. The high uncertainty? Um, the high uncertainty is mostly, so basically all the uncertainty is bound to our insufficient understanding of carbon export. So because when we, what I did was I compiled all the B values. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with B values of the Martin curve. So this is this exponent that kind of de determines the attenuation of carbon flux with depth. And there's a huge range of B values out there. And, the, and that has just such a large influence because it matters a lot if 10% of the carbon get respired in the surface or 50, right? So all this, uh, not all, but the majority of the uncertainty comes from there. So what we need is a better understanding mechanistically how carbon export works in terms of what factors uh, influence attenuation. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I, uh, well, let me, let me um, ask the other question that's in the chat right now, and then I'll get to my questions. Um, this question is from Abby. So Leonard, did you calculate the potential scale in gigatons per year of the shelf OIF? Yeah, we did that. That got killed in the review process. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, 1.3 gigaton CO2 per year, a plus minus one gigaton. <laughs> um, and that was that was based on the assumption, and that is a very questionable assumption, of course, that we assumed that what ha like how high would the potential be of all the nutrients, macronutrients that are available to fuel productivity would, would be utilized. And not you know not be downwelled as preformed nutrients with Antarctic bottom water. So if all of that would have been utilized, of course that would never happen because there's just not enough light energy to utilize all macronutrients. But that is the theoretical uh, maximum based on that constraint: one point three gigatons per year, plus minus one. <laughs> Okay, I want to ask uh, a general question for all three of us speakers, and I guess Leonard just answered this a little bit about the export. What do you think the biggest gaps are in our current research um, specific to MCDR and the Southern Ocean or specific processes that uh, are relevant for marine CDR in the Southern Ocean? And that can be both observational or model kind of gaps. I can go, which um, I touched upon a little bit, but I think one of the biggest challenges for um, like realistic MRV and quantifying of actual projects is this bridging of these large um, range of spatial and temporal scales. So for OAE, if you have alkalinity addition at a point source and then air-sea gas exchange that happens on much larger spatial and time scales, um, how do we bridge the near field uh, gap? And I think oceanographers are really great at thinking about these multi-scale problems, but um, I think the gap that would be great to see more research in is just like applying that type of thinking to MCDR specifically. Manon or Leonard, do you want to respond to that yeah. one as well? Yeah, I think the uh, Southern Ocean is not in primary focus for marine CDR at this point. 
I mean, ocean iron fertilization, yes, but it's kind of dead anyways, right? So no one's really seriously pursuing that at the moment. Um, yeah, the Southern Ocean is just too remote, I think, because much of the much of the constraints currently are logistical ones. Mm -hmm. And um, so no one's really, I think, I mean, I've never seen it and I, I personally wouldn't do it either, uh, target the Southern Ocean at this stage. And uh, maybe uh, I could add uh, for OAE, uh, like having uh, like detectable uh, Delta PCO2, like maybe more invest investigating the Delta PCO2 limit that uh, we can uh, detect and compare this to the change in pH in uh, the saturation state, like does it will, um, like will we reach like production of carbonate, like uh, um precipitation precipitation um so yeah i think uh, this uh, te this technical uh, um technical constraints need to be more resolved too i have a related question and perhaps leonard already had his take on this do you think like you know between all this reach research and the different areas identified do you think there's sort of identified regions or specific locations that could be the focus of future field trials um, in the Southern Ocean or, you know, focused research in specific locations, or is it just too remote and too hard <laughs> to get to these places that it's unlikely that, you know, we would <laughs> want to invest that kind of focused research in the Southern Ocean? I... Um, yeah, look, I, I think um, there's some research going on with the natural analogs and Kerguelen research. Um, I think that is that is a, a nice way to to kind of investigate the issue. I don't think it will necessarily lead into MCDR, but it, it, it provides that foundational knowledge, of course. Personally, I would find it very tempting to to do a iron for mesoscale iron fertilization study like on the shelves just to kind of prove a principle thing. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I would not think that this could lead to any like MCDR on a commercial scale because the you know how it is you can't you can't <laughs> it's very like all all this I mean the Zeus community is also. Uh, very clear, heavily invested in that. And I, I think like glaciologists or like the guys who work on the Southern Ocean are perhaps the cons most conservative of the conservative in terms of like protect that environment, right? I just could never see that happening in, in Antarctica, like deep down there, like when there's pingu penguins floating around and things like that, right? It won't happen, <laughs> it just won't happen. So yeah, but nevertheless, it would be very exciting to do that type of stuff just to under to see if kind of, if that understanding is correct. I agree with Leonard that there's probably um, a lot of challenges to scaling any MCDR approach beyond initial pilot studies in the Southern Ocean. Um, I don't wanna say like never or something that's impossible, but just other considerations are, you know, to uh, when we think about like a complete MRV, we need to consider all the life cycle emissions related with your project. And I think just getting materials to the Southern Ocean, um, all the transportation costs or the travel emissions, like those all need to be factored into your net CO2 removal calculation. And at the end of the day, I don't know if that would be um, a feasible business model or not. Mm. But there are some, you know, repeat ship lines from, uh, South America or from Australia, you know, towards Antarctica. And certainly there are coastal populations in the Southern Hemisphere there that may be interested in, in that um, opportunity. But I, I agree that I know, I know how hard it is to get down there and work there, but um, yeah. I see Abby has a hand up. Abby, do you want to ask a question? Let's see if I can unmute you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's just more of a comment on this this conversation we're having. I've, um, I've, I would never underestimate the the ideas out there and like the venture capital and uh, uh, you know, carbon dioxide removal world. Like I've talked to people who want to combine, um, 
uh, like ecotourism to Antarctica with uh, ocean iron fertilization. Like, I don't know if that idea will go anywhere, but, um, you know, there's all kinds of ideas out there for uh, mm -hmm. doing this kind of work. And I'm, I'm neither an Antarctic expert or ocean iron fertilization, fertilization expert, so can't speak to what a good or bad idea that is, but uh, yeah, there's, there's ideas out there to kind of monetize this type of work. Thanks for that perspective. Can I quickly, can I quickly respond? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yes, the, I, I agree that these ideas are abundant, but I can't like look just the just the from a legal perspective, those would never uh, be possible because you you know you have the Antarctic Treaty, you have Kamla, uh, you have um, the the London Protocol. You have like so many overlapping jurisdictions and then uh, the Ross Sea where it could make sense is a marine, marine protected area under Kamla. So even if they wanted to, it would be, yeah. I mean, maybe in 50 years from now, if everything changes, but in the current environment, uh, yeah. I mean, it's hard to do OAE in a, in, a, in a harbor, right? That is completely polluted already. How would you, how would you do that in Antarctica? I, yeah. I'm almost certain it won't happen. Okay, I'm going to ask one final question before we wrap up. Um, because this is a SUS, a SOFLUX webinar. I mean, what, what kind of you know, you know, because because of this like MRV challenge of the, um, you know, SC gas exchange happening in huge areas. Even CDR that's done outside the Southern Ocean, the SC flux could be happening in the Southern Ocean. Uh, how can our sort of like basic ob uh, observing system, you know, what do, what do we need to like build capacity in our basic um, Southern Ocean observing system in order to be able to like do good MRV for marine CDR in general? Like, do we need you know, just more so, you know, SOCOM type floats, biogeochemical floats, and they're going to validate our models, or do we actually need a lot more um, SC flux carbon observations to improve and validate the models are representing the SC flux itself properly and those kinds of things? Anyone want to answer that one? Anyone want to go ahead? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think more measurements to validate models is always a good thing. Um, a note about air sea fluxes, I guess another gap that I would add to our knowledge is maybe the air sea fluxes specifically in coastal areas. Um, so like right near an OEE deployment site, those are that's where we might expect to see the largest uh, changes in the CO2 fluxes since you have the biggest um, Delta PCO2 between the ocean and atmosphere, but a lot of existing parameterizations are made more for open ocean and higher uncertainties. They have higher uncertainties in coastal areas, so that would be an area to do further research in. Yeah, uh, from a framework point of, point of view, I think it's a bit of a dream to assume that we'd be able to measure carbon, like, like, you know, tracing molecules. It's not going to, it's not going to happen. So perhaps the, no, the I best don't think that was to... a dream is more, how can we make sure that our models are representing the processes, processes as best as possible. That they're yeah. well valid. So sometimes there's a, in the community, there's sometimes the aspiration to actually measure, see, uh, do M MRV through actual measurements. And that's perhaps pro possible for some processes very near the deployment uh, side. But um, if, I, I think the better investment in time and energy from the research side is to, um, to do studies that work on improving critical parameterizations of the model and then use probably to have to be uh, data simulative models that um, mm -hmm. do the MRV job in the end. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's huge need for this type of research because the models are not good. <laughs> or at least not good enough. Sorry. Don't want to step on anyone's toes. But just for that, <laughs> just fine. for that MRV aspect, I, I think it's just, yeah, not there yet. 
Okay, so we are just one minute over time now. So we'll wrap up uh, another big thank you for all the speakers and thank you for everyone for attending and the great questions.